We're going to call to order the Boise Parks and Recreation Com Commission regular monthly meeting. And we'll start with attendance. Urban. Faber. Here. Carter. Johnson. Here. Mezu. Here. Raber. Here. Raziska. Here. Stidham. All right. And we will move on to new business. New business. Mm -hmm. Yep, new business. And let's uh, see. The minutes from February 16th, correct? Yep. Call for a motion. I call for a motion to accept approve. the, approve the minutes I'll from move. February 16th. Motion? I'll move. I'll move to approve. And second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Motion carry. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to item B. Yep. All right. And item B is a project initiative and Jason Miller. So um, my name is Jason Miller. I'm a landscape architect in the Park, Boise Park and Rec Department. And I'm going to be giving some, uh, I'm here today to provide updates to our projects, including our ongoing initiatives. Um, and here are the specific items that I would like to discuss. Um, wrapping up our projects, which are, are new amenities and assets to be added to the park portfolio. Um, ongoing projects, our various projects, our team is actively working to complete kind of looking ahead, what's on the draft boards, what's on pause, looking at our sustainability initiatives, as well as our design and development team restructuring. Um, those are my topics. So, so slide one, wrapping up the projects I will complete in FY23. The first one is a Boise River Greenbelt Lighting Project. This is a project that was brought to, it's an energized product project that was brought to us by the Neighborhood Association. It extended pedestrian scale lighting along the Greenbelt from 9th Street Bridge to Ann Morrison Park. The project serves the students at BSU as well as the Greenbelt users. The cost on this was 385,000 and it is complete and can be enjoyed now. The next project is uh, Cassia Park, which is a major R&M funded park. Um, the goal is to provide shade structures for um, the playground amenities. Um, this one has taken some time as it did go to, through a legal process. There were numerous delays in implementing the project, but we're excited to announce that the shade structures are in place and the residents can enjoy them this upcoming summer. The total cost of this project was $60,000 and it was, it's substantially complete and it's awaiting final landscaping. One of the largest projects that we're working on right now is the Ann Morrison Park Fountain. Um, as everyone knows, Ann Morrison is one of the most highly used parks in the city of Boise. The fountain is the centerpiece of the park. It was outdated, it was in constant need of maintenance. A newly designed interactive water feature will meet the current standards for water quality and provide a universal accessibility experience for all users. Um, this is funded through a combination of city funds and foundation funding, and the total cost is $2 million. A few fun facts about the fountain is that the fountain will have 69 active jets, 14 waterfalls with seating, non-slip accessible rubber surfacing. It took over 248 conduits and over 10 miles of wiring needed to uh, build the fountain. It will have 83 LED lights and the fountain is interactive as well as static and should make the letters A and M with a show sequence included. Um, this project began in fall of, of 2020 and it's on track to be completed by June of this year and it will include a ribbon cutting event. So stay tuned on that one. As a part of our overall master plan for Molnar Park, um, we're adding the amenities of a splash pad and a skate park this year. The funding is from a combination of different sources and uh, the skate park, the city is receiving a donation from J.A. Catherine Albertson Foundation to build the one of a kind skate park for the community. It is anticipated this will attract users from the entire region 
um, to this skate park. The splash pad is also being installed. The final amenities on the master plan include a volleyball court will be installed at a later date. The total cost for the skate park is $1 million. The splash pad is 1.2 million. And Memorial Day is the anticipated completion for the project. So I'm really excited about that one. So Julia Davis Park has, um, we've been adding amenities to the east end of the park. Um, this was done through a combination of funding sources. It's an installation of a new restroom and shelter at Julie Davis Park. This is near the intersection of Myrtle and South Broadway um, with the goal to provide service to that area of the park. The restroom will serve the tennis courts, the cancer survivor memorial, the shelters, the large play field, and the Greenbelt users. The total cost is 1.2 million and the scheduled completion, it will be open later this spring and we are already taking reservations for the shelter this summer. So. so a bridge in Julie Davis Park located at the entrance of the park along River Street near 3rd and Myrtle is currently failing in need of replacement. The bridge was noted to have significant structural issues in 2022 and the project was prioritized due to the ongoing need for access to the zoo and amenities on the east side of the park. It serves as a service entrance to the zoo and provides access to the bocce ball, toddler playground and tennis courts. This is being repaired using capital funds. The total cost is 700,000 and the schedule for completion. The project is scheduled to start right after tree fort it is anticipated to be complete by June. Park patrons will have alternate routes during construction because of previously improved roadways within Julia Davis Park. The next one is Hawkins Ranch Reserve Trailhead. This one was funded from Ridges to Rivers Heritage Funding and Impact Fees. The total cost was $1 million. The trailhead is the last step in providing the public access to Hawkins Range Reserve. There are 400 acres of open space and critical wildlife habitat purchased by the city in 2016 and 2017. The trailhead will include ADA parking, 25 stalls, restroom, horse trailer, and turnaround. Um, the schedule completion for this, there will be a ribbon cutting schedule for May 4th, and the area will be seasonally closed from December 1st to April 30th, with a dog on leash requirement from May 1st to June 15th for elk calving. At Pine Grove Park, we're adding some amenities to the park. Uh, Pine Grove Park is located on Maple Grove between Franklin and Overland. Uh, the park will include two new shelters, a new playground, and surfacing in the dog park. This is funded with impact fees. The total cost is 1.7 million and the estimated completion is spring of 2023. So Veterans Memorial Park Master Plan, Boise Park and Recreation is um, in a lease agreement with Idaho State Parks and Recreation, which requires a master plan update in 2023. We started this process in January with holding the public open house. We received over 1,300 responses, and the master plan update will be presented to the commission in, the, in May. Uh, the master plan update will include a new amenity in the park. Um, survey results included strong support for a nature playground, a shaded plaza, and disc golf. Uh, numerous security and safety concerns were identified in the survey as well, and a portion of the new amenity funding is planned to be allocated to address safety within the park. Um, this is going to be paid for with the impact fees, and there's $660,000 for a future amenity. For our ongoing projects, our projects that will continue to move forward, um, we have Primrose Park. This is located on Gary Lane, north of State Street. It's a 1.5 acre park with a playground, adult fitness area, pavilion, seating, pollinator garden, ADA parking, an open lawn, and a walking loop. It's currently at 90% construction documents pending ACHD approval. And um, the total cost is 700,000 funded by the capital fund. It's anticipated construction is 2023, summer 2023. So Goddard Park is located north of Capitol High along Goddard Road between Maple Grove and Glenwood Street. It's south of Settlers Canal and it will serve the pathway connection between Hidden Lakes Reserve and the future Spalding Ranch. Um, the project includes a 10 foot wide multi-use trail, shade pavilion, pollinator garden, native plant garden, and sensory garden. It's anticipated construction is late summer 2023. 
This was an energized project that was brought forward by the neighborhood. Eagle Rock Park uh, pickleball courts is also being um, completed this summer. Spalding Ranch located at Cole Road and Goddard. We're anticipating a construction late summer, early fall for a new roadway through the northeast corner of the park, kind of connect, connecting Glenwood with uh, coal. And then the Boise Whitewater Park, we have uh, phase two future improvements are planned once phase one is complete. And then we also have a Warm Springs golf course for a new facility there. So looking, at, looking ahead, projects that will occur in FY24, we have the mausoleum where repairs to the building uncovered significant roof damage and replacement was needed. The repairs will provide a safe and improved mausoleum for visitors. The cost is 268,000. The Hawaii parking lot, part of the Hawaii park is a five acre neighborhood park on the bench near Vista and I-84. Um, the current parking lot has degraded condition resulting in the need for repairs to the surfaces. And the parking lot improvements will benefit the central bench and the cost is 150,000. Um, Esther Simplot floodplain improvements are, is work that is ongoing. Uh, we're partnering with uh, Public Works to uh, provide enhancements that are needed to meet FEMA requirements. And then we have Julie Davis Rose Garden, which is um, um, fundraising stage. It's in the fundraising stage by an outside consultant. Um, Ann Morrison Park, we have the park clock tower with the Harry W. Morrison Foundation has proposed to relocate and enhance the clock tower in Ann Morrison Park. The clock tower is an iconic landmark in Ann Morrison Park and has been out of function for a few years and will benefit park users and events by being relocated and repaired. 521 Grove C CCDC is developing a park at Sixton Grove to be donated to Boise Parks. Um, an open house is scheduled for early April with three concepts being presented to the public from the design team. Willow Lane, the Rotary Club, is developing a design for a pathway and Memorial Park amenity at Willow Lane. The Rotary will pay for design and construction of that and donate, and donate to the city. So projects that are currently on pause include um, South and Lowell Pool considerations. We agreed to postpone the pool projects until funding source is identified. And then we have the goal for the um, improvements to the Whitewater Park phase one. The goal is to update phase two to create a low hazard stable wave for year round recreation, then proceed to the phase one updates. So they kind of work together in order for the hydraulic model to work out, so. Um, as far as department initiatives, we have three, three initiatives that we're working on ongoing. We have America the Beautiful. Um, the slide shows that, you know, with our goal is to conserve 30% of the land and water by 2030. In 2022, these are some of the highlights. We added 1.6% um, to our open space, bringing it to 19.6. We added 1.7 to the park site management, bringing it to 16.7. And we funded two open space improvement projects, two trail accessibility improvements, and, and Hawkins Range Reserve Trail and Trailhead. Um, the City of Trees is kind of our second initiative that we're have working within our department, in which we partner with the Treasure Valley Tree Canopy and the Nature Conservancy of Idaho. The goal of one tree for every household, which is 100,000 trees, is currently at 15,000, and we expect to continue to see that number increase throughout the year. We also anticipate that we'll be achieving the second goal of sponsoring one seedling for every person in the city, 235,000 trees, and we're currently at 149. Yep, uh, the tree assessment is being updated this year. The tree canopy assessment is the key to identifying locations for where and how to plant trees. And our 10 year old assessment shows 16% canopy with our target of 30. So we're hoping our numbers will project better than that when they come back in. Um, the Boise tree captains will continue and be the most direct way for citizens to obtain trees through for the community. The coupon program will remain as well with our partner nurseries of Zamzow, Edwards and Franz Witte. This year, this is the first year the outside funding will match the internal funding with two key grants and events that are planned. There's 35,000 for the Arbor Day planting at Lowell Scott Middle School across from McDevitt. And then there's also 15,000 allocated for 10 park sites to receive trees this fall. 
Our third and final initiative is the 10 minute walk to a park initiative. The city has set a goal to have every household within city limits to be within a 10 minute walk of a park or open space. We're currently at 64.6%. Um, so we continue to identify opportunities to kind of expand our park and open space access. Um, areas identified as gaps in service are West Boise, Southwest Boise, and Southeast Boise. Once a 10 minute walk gap is identified, areas are prioritized based on the six equally weighted factors, which are population density, density of low income households, density of people of color, air pollution, respiratory hazard, urban heat islands, mental and physical health. And so our team has been working to identify these areas have uh, like three, pro three projects have developed from, from this plan, which include Primrose Park, the Linear Park and Pathway at Goddard, as well as our newest park, which is Shamrock Park. So those are all items that have come from this initiative. Final thing is just our design and development uh, restructuring that we're doing in our parks department. Um, Sarah Arkel has kind of taken the initiative on this to create a new structure for our team. Previously, there were three LAs that were working as individual project managers, and the new team will be more agile and adaptable and able to deliver projects to the community in a timely manner, as well as reduce project costs. And so we're excited about that. It includes a construction lead to kind of handle the day-to-day -day construction coordination piece, uh, site visits, change requests, et cetera. Um, an LA designer focused on design and production, and then a design and development project manager who will serve to coordinate the team with kind of planning GIS and design to improve quality control and kind of define the workload for the team. And I just want to say, um, given all the work that's going on, I want to thank our team for their efforts and for um, the things that they're doing to keep all of these moving forward. That includes Sarah Oracle for kind of setting the course, Eden Beg Beglinger for coordinating the team, Trevor Kisner for his planning efforts, Dan Falconer for kind of overseeing the implementation, and Jeff and Stacy for their GIS and support throughout the process. With that, I would like to open it up for questions. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, commission members, thank you, Jason. Um, and it, we went through it really quick because um, we need to keep moving because there's, <laughs> I think there's a certain basketball game <laughs> or something happening that I'm told we got to really keep this moving. So I appreciate Jason. He would have taken a lot more time, I think, on some of the project, but I just want to outline, um, I hope the commission uh, recognizes the work that uh, the department is going through on uh, projects that we're going to be finishing up, projects that we're, uh, that we're excited about coming down the line. Um, one of the things that Jason went over real quick was that last slide on the re restructuring. Um, we really felt like we need to do something different with our landscape architects and with our design and development team. So we had three landscape architects um, that um, reported into the park division and they wore all the hats. They did the design, they put together the bid documents, they put it out on the street, they would get the bid back and then they would manage the actual construction out in the field. And it's hard to do all of those things at once when here comes another project down the line, we need you back in the office, to work on the design piece on that. And then here's another one needs, you know, bid docs need to be put together. And so Sarah Arkel, our superintendent of parks came up with a plan that is gonna work perfectly for us. And the first move we did is first off our three landscape architects, ironically, all got jobs in the private sector all within about six months of each other. And so one left and then Sarah started thinking, how are we going to restructure this? And then the second left and then we're like, okay, now we do need to do something a little bit different. Um, and then we lost our third. And at the same time, we hired Jason. So Jason is the lone landscape architect out of three that we used to have doing all the work. But what we did is rather than make Jason put a hat on and go out into the field and actually manage what our contractors are doing, that's where we hired someone who has that expertise that that's all he does. And it's uh, Dan Falconer, uh, who is already part of our team. And his job is just to make sure it's getting done and getting done right. So he is running herd on all of our uh, contractors out in the field. So all the projects you see going on, Dan's going from project to project to make sure that it's getting done. So our landscape folks 
can be strategic. They can be innovative. They can spend more time looking at design, cool things that we want to see in designs in the future and not have to worry about all the other hats that they have to wear. The third position that will fill those three landscapes. So we filled two, one with an outside construction our, our Dan Falconer being our, our on-site construction manager, Jason Field one as the landscape architect. And then the third position is going to be a manager that will oversee all of the functions in that, in that group, which we've never had previously. So they will oversee the GIS piece, the design piece, and then the outside construction piece. So we're looking for a unique individual that has good, strong project management background. They may or may not be a landscape architect. They may be um, have strong project manager, construction project manager experience. Um, we're just kind of looking for that unicorn that can oversee the entire uh, division that we have there now. And so we're real excited about what already is happening. And I got to say, Jason, you have done a fantastic job. It, I, his productivity, his efficiency, his creativity, um, and, and I don't want to take anything away from the previous landscape architects we've had, but sometimes when you get, it's like a coach. A new coach comes in, they have a whole different view of how things could be done and should be done. And all of a sudden you're winning games and maybe winning more games. And that's the way I feel when we hired Jason is he just came in and, and he just has a different view and it's a really good view. And so we're real excited about the work that he's doing uh, with us. And we stole him from a private company. So we lost three to private. And then we went out and got somebody from private. <laughs> um, yes, right. And, and Jason actually was one of our um, companies we've done a lot of work with was, was GGLO, which has done a ton of work for uh, parks and recreation and for the city in general. And he was a landscape architect with that organization. And we, we got him. And so we're real excited about that. So that part, we're, we're really, it's going to allow us to be better at what we do and in our project management and in, in really um, executing the work that, that we're doing. And you see, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, we're trying to be very judicious in adding a lot, of, a lot more things. Um, so the stuff you see going on there is plenty to, to keep us busy for the next, all the way through 24 and then we'll look at what, what's coming down the line in 25 and 26. So uh, nice work, Jason. Um, and then, so Madam President, I would, I think Jason would stand for any questions if anybody. Do we have any questions from the commissioners for Jason? Well, I would just like to say thank you because the work is amazing. I. Uh, I head up the Boise Soul Food Festival at Julia Davis Park, and we're just excited, super excited for the work that's being done in Julia Davis Park. That's our home where we plan to stay. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Anyone that's great else? To hear. Thank you. I would, I would second that. Um, one of the things that I was sworn to when I came on the commission was making sure anytime we do a new park that we can try to have like a water feature for kids to interact with. Right. Mm -hmm. So I really love the design with Molinar. There's so much to love in all of this stuff that you presented today, but that's just one particular piece for me that, um, you know, kind of on that end of town too, on the, the South, uh, having a park where the kids can go nice, big park right across the street from a elementary, right. A lot of kids. Right. And so uh, that's a really cool feature. So keep up the good work in all of it. But, uh, you know, being the, the architect guy, keeping the, the focus on some of those water features is really great for our kids. So thanks Thank for you. doing that. Thank you. Will do. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm glad that you're putting the pressure on the water features because I, <laughs> I think sometimes when the city staff and Doug sees them come up, they're like, "Woo, this is great. Another water feature that we got to figure out how to run 10 miles of wiring to and <laughs> all the lights and everything else that goes with it. Um, I just want to say thanks for the presentation. I think it's, it's so cool. And whenever I see something like this, like that's a cool project, that's a cool project. And then it starts to add up and you're like, holy crap, this is a lot of, you know, really cool things. And I think it makes me think about how rad it would be to be um, working in the parks department, to have your thumbprint on so many things that mean so much to so many folks in the community. Um, but to all of you all as well who don't um, actually get paid to to be here, I hope that you can see your thumbprint on it well as well when you see all these projects that you've been a part of 
some of them virtually during COVID that you had to show up for and continue pushing. So yeah, thanks to everybody all the way around. It really is neat to see so many things and, and so much progress that the department has made. Madam Chair, um, speaking of working for free, um, brings the question up of funding. Uh, Doug or Jason, can you um, give us some idea of how future funding looks? Are we going to be doing well and be able to do more projects or are we having to cut back? Uh, Madam, Madam President, Commission members, um, all of our capital plan is built upon um, impact fees. So any new projects, so the, the um, so there's really three buckets of money. We have an equipment bucket of money. We have a major repair and maintenance bucket of money. That's a general fund money that comes as an allocation from the city that we can use to maintain what we have uh, and replace what we have. And then the third bucket is the capital piece where we build new things. And that is 99% um, driven by impact fees. So the concept is obviously growth pays for itself. And so as impact fees are collected in the different regions, the different planning areas of the city, we have access to that to that to make plans on what we're going to do with that in those different planning areas. So um, we do have a capital plan that takes us out and we we're happy to bring that to the commission for your uh, review. So you can see some of the things we're planning over the next you know, five years, for example, but we do have plans over the next five years, but it is based upon uh, forecast and projections on what we plan on co collecting from those different planning areas uh, to be able to have the funding to 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 do some things. So give you an example, in our 24 plan, we have um, a master plan update for McDevitt Youth Sports Complex, which is out at Eagle Road and McMillan. And um, we'll work with the neighborhood on what uh, that plan will look like, but we have about 1.2 million in that account. So we will work with the neighborhood to master plan what that 1.2 million could go go towards. And it's a new concept we're doing in parks and recreation here in Boise, where before we would do a master plan, it's the grand plan, and it's going to cost X number of millions, and someday we'll get to it. So now what we do is we only master plan what we have funding for. So for McDevitt, for example, we know we have 1.2 million, we'll go to the neighborhood and said, here's what you can get for 1.2 million. And if you want a splash pad, it might eat up a good portion of that, um, but, uh, if you want sports fields, it's a little bit less expensive to green up the space as opposed to add the amenities in. So that gives you an example of kind of what, how it works. So, um, but we're contingent. We also could get general fund money and that is, uh, so the splash pad at Molinar now is being paid for by city funding that, that, uh, the city actually allocated the council allocated money to get that done. And then we always have our partnerships. So the skate park at Molinar is being funded by the JA and Catherine Albertson Family Foundation to the tune of a million dollars. And that was in the master plan to do that someday. Someday probably was going to be a long ways down the road to do that. So the fact that we got that donation, get that uh, speeded up a little bit as well. So hope that answers your question that we have a plan and we have matching funding in impact fees. And if we don't have that, and we still want to execute some of those things in the plan, then we would be required to go back to the city and say, we're going to need council member Halliburton. We're going to need funding to close the gap if we want to do, do something. But it's not uncommon for the council to come to us and say, where's, where's this at? We don't have the funding to do it. Well, maybe we'll provide that then to do that. But I, I really like the idea of growth paying for itself. And so um, impact fees are pretty important to our development. So it's fair to say that our growth is a trailing indicator of the growth that we're seeing, right? And so we wait for the money to be put in and then we spend it. Correct, uh, Madam President, Commission members. There have been occasions where we have borrowed against impact fees to get something done sooner. And then as those fees come in, then it replenishes that account. That's just taking money from the general fund, loaning it to ourselves while we're waiting for the impact fees to be reimbursed through that uh, concept. We have done that. Um, we prefer not to do that. We prefer to, to wait for the funding to be available and then um, execute and implement whatever projects we have uh, moving forward. But um, when people talk about growth, that's just, and I'm glad you brought it up, Commissioner, that, you know, as much as it 
cannot be a great word for a lot of people. Growth helps us in parks and recreation because growth contributes to impact fees, which allows us to build literally, I believe within the last five years, we've spent somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 to 13 million on new projects, all came from impact fees, didn't come from the general fund. And those were generated by new construction. So we're a great example of how growth can really work in a community if it's done the right way. And if we plan it the right way to actually provide amenities that are um, needed to keep up with that growth as well. Madam President and commissioners, uh, quick question. Um, first of all, thank you. I mean, this is all amazing. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's it's just wonderful to see what's going on in Boise, the Parks and Rec Department. Um, America the Beautiful Initiative. I'm wondering, um, you know, speaking of funding and all that sort of thing, is there, and I apologize, I'm still kind of new, is there a strategy for building out, you know, because the the, I think it was the open space. There was another bar that showed it pretty far back. Is there a, a strategy that maybe goes along with that capital plan? Uh, Madam President, commissioners, commission members, yes. The, the short answer is yes. Um, we are looking at every project, and Jason could even jump in. Wherever we're doing design work, we're, we have an eye to that on how we can implement different types of amenities in our in our park design that will contribute to that um, 30% goal. And we're making great progress. Um, the mayor and I did a, a presentation yesterday uh, up at the Foothills Learning Center, and we both got an opportunity to talk quite a bit about the America the Beautiful Initiative, which is a mayoral driven initiative uh, in our department. And we're we're adding one and 2% uh, every year. And we already were in that 13 to 14. So now we're, we're somewhere in that 16 to 17% range. And so by 2030, at the clip we're going at right now, we're easily will hit that 30% by 2030, which is amazing. Um, but I think it's it's our eye is on that, that we want to make sure that we're adding those amenities that are contributing to that land and water piece uh, on the America the Beautiful initiative. Ooh, any more questions, commissioners? No exec session. Oh, yep, no executive session. So can I get a motion that we adjourn? So moved. Second. <clears throat> That's it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we did it. <laughs> <laughs>